to see you. And I hope that uh, you are going to enjoy today. Uh, I'm not going to be able to give an introduction to myself in every single session, uh, but every session is being recorded. So just to let you know, by the way, that this session is now being recorded. So uh, you're more than welcome. And I would maybe recommend that you uh, switch uh, your microphone off. I'll just do that. Uh, and uh, if you switch your camera off as well, if you want to, you can more than, but sometimes it shows up just at the top of the screen. Doesn't always, but sometimes does, uh, just so that you, you have your, your privacy. Um, so what we're going to do today is we, we talked on, on Monday uh, about this idea about where does uh, our, wh how does our mind work? And basically where we got to was this idea that thoughts cause feelings, that we can focus on the triggers and the things that cause it, and we can try and avoid them. That's sometimes work, uh, but it doesn't work for long term because that's not actually the issue. We can focus on how we behave and the actions that we do uh, and how we um, actually go out there and, and perform in the world and we can try willpower and we can try pushing it on. Mm. But do you know what? That sometimes just as a face and, and therefore doesn't always work either. Then when we come to our feelings, what we tend to do is we tend to medicate them. And that's fine in, in certain cases. It's okay because some of our medications are massively positive, like going to the gym, maybe your relationship, uh, your friendship, social life. Well, what's a social life? Uh, what's one of them? Anybody else just absolutely can't wait to go out for dinner. It was one of my favorite things to do. And it's, it's like, ah, I've got a, like a restaurant about like a mile up the road that just does the most amazing steak pie and chips. Anyway, so, or sorry, it does also fish and chips, you know, for anybody. And I'm sure they're all locally sourced and, and fantastically healthy. Uh, anyway, so, uh, and, um, but actually where all of our things come from and all of our, our uh, emotions are driven from is this little movie screen that runs inside our heads. And if you remember what we talked about was the fact that we can imagine it like, uh, like by just imagining lemons. If you imagine, remember I did this on, on Monday, if you imagine eating a lemon, then what happens is, and even now, I, I do this all the time. And every time I do the eating the lemon thing, my mouth starts to water. And if the lemon doesn't work for you, then perhaps, as I said the other day, mango, pineapple, chili peppers, I, I don't know what it is for you. But when you think about those things, your mind will respond and it will react. And this is actually, this, this place in here is where everything comes from. Now, how does stuff get in here though? And that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit today. And how does it actually function? Like, why is it that, for instance, one person, well, we spoke about this the other day, one person could be absolutely terrified of boats, whereas somebody else isn't. One person is scared of flying, where another person isn't. One person picks up spiders in their hands and puts them out in the garden, whereas another person can't even move within six feet of a spider uh, without wanting to vomit and scream. You know, why is it that these are different? Because ultimately, you would think that we might all be the same. You know, that actually, we, we, if, if life was like that, if life was all the same, then would that not be easier? But it's not. You know, we blame the outside world for a lot of things. We say, well, it's the spider's fault. It's not the spider. You're looking at the same spider that I am, well, not right now, but you know what I mean. We could both be looking at exactly the same spider, but we will respond to it in absolutely different ways. You could tell me about your passion and your, the, the thing that, that just lights you up, that you're most interested in. And I could sit there and go, okay. Super. <laughs> Good. With absolutely zero interest in it at all. But we're just dealing with the same thing, but you have a completely different response to it. I'd sit here and talk to you about football, you know, which is one of my big interests and one of the things that I love to do and I'm missing it dearly. I'm missing it terribly. Um, but you might sit there and go, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. And that's allowed. And the reason that that happens is because of what happens in here. Now, Ultimately, your mind creates meaning. Now, what we mean by creating meaning is that your mind takes the outside world, it goes inside, and once it goes inside, your mind attaches a meaning to it. It says, okay, is this thing that I am currently experiencing a good thing or a bad thing? 
which is it? Which one? Do I feel pleasure about this thing that's currently happening just now? Or do I feel pain about this thing uh, that's currently happening just now? And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about that a little bit more the next time and how we learn how the difference or what the difference between good and bad is. Today, I'm just going to talk about how our mind basically attributes pleasure and pain to things rather than the creation of that pleasure and pain, good and bad. But we'll talk about that on Friday. So as something comes in, you know, I, I could, if, I don't know, maybe some of you are into football, you know, I could show you my football team and you could have a, a visceral reaction to it, whereas it might be like a, oh, right. It might be like a, oh my God. It might also be a, mm, yeah, whatever. And the reason is, is because of meaning. So ultimately, all of life is governed by pleasure and pain. You know, you are making decisions. I say to people all the time, you are a decision-making machine. That is what you are. You make decisions every day. In fact, there's some fascinating work out there. There's a brilliant TED Talk. I can't remember who did it. There's a great TED Talk uh, on, um, uh, on de decision fatigue. And the fact that now, actually, as, a, as a human beings, as a, as a population, especially in the Western world, we have created a world where we have to make so many decisions about stupid things that actually our mind is now tired when it comes to making decisions about the really important things in life. We're so used now to, for instance, not just going in and ordering a coffee, but actually, you know, you want a extra hot soy caramel macchiato, but with no chocolate and something else. I don't know what it is. I've got to admit, I pretty much drink peppermint tea all the time. So uh, I, I get my, my Starbucks Costa Cafe Nero uh, knowledge isn't, I've got to admit, particularly brilliant. But I'm sure one of my daughters orders that drink. I'm sure that's, that's hers. So why does it like so basically that these decisions sorry that we have to make are tiring our brains out and therefore when it comes to decisions about relationships careers and what we're going to do sometimes we're just tired as we spoke about you know before and we will speak about again and uh, next a week today we'll be speaking about how you've got a really lazy brain you have a particularly lazy brain even the very intelligent amongst you you may be even the most intelligent people who are on here potentially have the laziest brains of all. But lazy doesn't mean that it's not working well. It just means that it's lazy. But we'll get to that uh, in, in, in next week. So what do I mean by uh, the fact that we attribute meaning? So here's how I do it. I, I imagine that the mind is a bit like a bubble. Now, here we go. I am going to uh, share a screen uh, with you just now. So hopefully everybody should be able now to see that. Um, now, uh, the idea here is that basically what we have and, uh, and how we work is that we have, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to get the right window up. There we go. No, that's the wrong one. Um, give me one second. Sorry, see that I have failed. I have absolutely failed. Now I've got it. Uh, I have failed in my uh, preparation of my screen share. So I imagine basically that the mind is like a bubble. And if you imagine that basically what happens is, is you live inside that bubble. So you live in the bubble. And the bubble is, if I was to give you a little bit more of a technical phrase, right, the bubble is a perceptual filter. So what we mean by that is it is filtering your perception. As we spoke about on Monday, the world is all about how we perceive the world. It's all about perception. The question is, is what happens inside the bubble? That's where the, the perception is made. Now, if there's your lemon, if you want a wee picture of a lemon, just in case you didn't know what one looked like. Um, and ultimately, information is flooding into your bubble all the time. And how it's flooding in is through your senses. So you see it, you hear it, you feel it, you smell it, and you taste it. That's it. That's it. They're the five senses that you have. And all of them can work internally as well as externally. So what I mean by that is you can imagine them. So for instance, seeing isn't just about seeing things in your outside world. You can actually also, uh, you can see things um, uh, like as in, inside your head. You can imagine, you can hear voices inside your head. Some of you might be thinking, oh my God, he knows. Uh, yes, I do. And some of those voices aren't actually that big a problem, can I say? Uh, as, as I know most of them are you, and that's the most important thing. We can feel, you can imagine feelings. We can switch on emotions at the moment. I could ask you to imagine something like the lemon, and you'd be able to switch on an emotion. So. 
what happens in smell and taste obviously as well not quite as powerful because uh, we don't tend to train them up as much but seeing hearing and feeling now when this information comes in through our bubble now this is what we're going to talk about on friday but your bubble is ultimately made of all of your beliefs your values uh, your experiences you have built that bubble over your whole life for example our example that we used the other day uh, i'm sure I'm starting to get mixed up now with who I talked about, talked to, but uh, I think I used the rainbow example the other day, for example. You know, that if we were to look outside and see a rainbow, then we attribute meaning to that rainbow, uh, depending on who it is and how it is and how we've been brought up. And this is what that bubble is. The interesting bit about the bubble, though, is what happens on the inside of it. Because what happens as it comes through is that we go through three processes, three filtering processes, where we decide and work out how important the information is that's coming in and how it is that we feel about it. And the first thing that we do with this information is we ignore lots of it. We just ignore it. We just don't even know. How many times, for instance, have you looked at your watch to see the time, put your, fan, your hand down, and somebody goes, oh, sorry, what's the time? And you go, uh, oh, it's... And you have to look back at your wrist again because actually that information, you know you took it in, but you've no idea where you put it. It just went in, was almost instantly ignored, and then poof, and off it went. How many times have you got a text message, especially when you're doing something else, so your bubble is focused, maybe you're working hard, you're really focused on a piece of work, and somebody sends you a text message about, can you remember, I'm thinking about normal life here, but can you remember to get milk on your way home from work, or can you get a loaf of bread on your way home, but you're focused on something else, and you go, oh, yeah, yeah. But actually what has actually happened in that second that you looked at your phone is it just went and it just went out. One of the things that can happen is that I would guess that for many of us, I'm sure that this isn't true of us all, but I'm going to say that many of us who are on this call, how many people do we have? We have 22 people on this call. I am going to guess that there are quite a few uh, on this call that have a thing in their house that you really does your nut in. It, that, that, sorry, that's a Glasgow phrase. It annoys you and upsets you, but it does your nut in. Right? It your, it's, uh, I, did it, I said it very Glasgow, but anyway. Um, but actually what happens is you, you just totally ignore it. It's almost as if it's not there. And it just sits there, that peeling bit of wallpaper or that place where the, something leaked and you've got that water stain uh, in the corner of the room or... Uh, where that thing is broken and it doesn't quite work like it's meant to. You know, that actually, uh, oh, do you want hot water? Oh, sorry, to get hot water, what you have to do is see if you just like stomp really hard on that little bit of, uh, uh, of the floor. And if you stomp hard on that bit of the floor and then you have to turn the tap on and off really, really quickly, like three times. Uh, and if you do that, then the hot water will come on. You know, that type of thing. Uh, but actually what you do is you just ignore it. Now, in the bigger scheme of things, what sometimes people ignore a lot is they ignore anything that they become used to. Now, this is going to be a whole thing that we're going to talk about next week because we're going to talk about what the idea of normal is and, and what normal is and how normal is created. And that really comes into this ignoring thing. But how many things are you ignoring that actually really upset you? Do you want a bit of homework? Uh, you didn't think you were coming on here for homework. Uh, but if you want a bit of homework, if you have that, that thing, you know, that just a wee thing uh, that, that upsets you, my task for you is, is before Friday, go and sort it. Go and fix it. Do whatever you need to do. Now, if that means redecorating your whole room, then maybe that's a bit of a stretch before Wednesday or, or sorry, before Friday. But if it's just something small that would take you like 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, maybe even a little bit longer than that, go and sort it, go and fix it and notice the energy that it frees up once it's done. Because it's not that you don't know it's there. It's not that you're oblivious to it. You are ignoring it. You are actively ignoring it. And when this becomes the big things in life, this can be a thing that can cause people real mental health challenges. Brian's put his serious face on because it's serious chat time. So things like, for instance, lockdown has caused a lot of people, in fact, I've literally just come off a call with someone where lockdown has been causing issues in this person's relationship, where all of a sudden things that they were trying to ignore are now coming into stark focus because of the fact that they're there all the time. 
potentially people are finding uh, pieces of their careers and pieces of their jobs and their work that actually all of a sudden they're not ignoring anymore. Health issues that they're not ignoring anymore. And this is when it gets really serious because ignoring, although it's a natural process, it's not always a helpful process. Now, the other thing just for balance is that actually sometimes we do ignore things and it really helps us. So actually, you know, for instance, I would guarantee for many of you, I am going to imagine, I can't say for everybody on this call, but I'm going to imagine that many of you uh, have degrees. Some of you, I could see from just the names uh, that were coming up that some of you have PhDs and that you have studied, you have doctorates and all sorts of stuff. You're a very intelligent bunch, uh, you are in Scottish aquaculture. Um, and I know that when you were focused on doing those things, you probably ignored a lot. You probably ignored things like tiredness to get the last of it done. You probably had to ignore anxiety and various issues that you had to be able to get a piece of work done because what you knew inside your head was that what you were doing had a positive purpose, it had a reason for being, and that pushed you through. But while you were on that purpose, while you were on that thing, you had to ignore some of the negative sides of things that have happened. You know that if you're, you know, some people can ignore pain, for instance, you know, because to push through like sports people and people who are really dedicated to something physical. Can you ignore that pain? Can you ignore the chocolate fudge cake if you're on a diet? But that's another thing. So this is ignoring and it's massively important to your mental health because sometimes some of these things really need to be addressed. So I know I've set you some homework, but basically my question for you inside your bubble uh, in terms of um, uh, the, the ignoring, in, ter in terms of inside the bubble, is what are you ignoring and is it okay to ignore it? And if I can give you a really powerful mental health question that literally has just popped into my head, if you're ever helping someone with their mental health, like let's say they're anxious, depressed, and this might be true for you as well, so this question might work with you, if you're ever helping someone with their mental health, family member, colleague, anybody like that, doesn't matter who it is, we always ask about what the problem is. But if you want to find out what they're ignoring, why don't try asking them, not in any way that's like big fanfare, but just ask them what the problem isn't. What is the problem not? Where does the problem not show up? When are they not anxious? Because what you'll find with a lot of people is they'll say, oh, well, see when I'm with my friends, or when I'm with my family, oh, I'm totally calm. But, and this is the ignoring word, but is the ignoring word. So therefore what happens is, is they go, yeah, well, with my friends, I'm okay, but I'm anxious all the rest of the time. Well, are you? Is there anywhere else that it doesn't happen? And how much time do you actually spend? And what you can do is you can actually shrink the problem for someone. What a really big test on this. I actually wrote this down to talk to you guys about, I think I might have mentioned it at the end of, uh, of Mondays is that if you want to see somebody ignore something, now, can I just say, this is a particularly British thing. So if any of you are American, uh, you are fantastic at what I'm about to talk about. And certain nations and certain social cultures are much better at this. But Brits, us Brits, are crap at it. Uh, as Scottish people, oh, we're... <laughs> Uh, like, I mean, to, to go slightly more granular, Scots, oh, they're absolutely rubbish at it. And that is accepting a compliment. Accepting someone telling you how good you are or how beautiful you are or how fantastic you are or anything like that. And if you pay somebody a compliment, if you want to see it in action, you say something to somebody, I'm going to be very superficial. But let's say that you say to someone, I really love what you've done with your hair the standard answer will be, oh, yeah, well, but, but it needs cut. I mean, but at the moment, my, my roots are coming in, or but this, or but that, or they'll butt away your comment. They'll butt away the compliment. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, sorry. Uh, I don't know. There might be another one. So they'll butt away your compliment. They'll shove it away, and they'll, they'll make it go away. This is ignoring an action. Anyway, let's go on. Let's go on to the next one. So this is the first thing that you're, you're, you're doing this. You can't not do it, by the way. You, you can try not to. Your brain will explode. So that's messy. We don't want that. The next thing that happens is you bend reality. Right? So you bend reality to make it fit what you want. Whereas we ignore what we're used to 
we now have, oh, this is what my bubble says is true, so I'm going to bend reality. This was my rainbow example. Just as a wee reminder, the rainbow example is basically, if you look out the window and see a, a rainbow, uh, then some people will say, look at the glory of God. Aren't they fantastic that God has given me this? If you're a wee bit more scientific, you might say, and you can be both, as I said on Monday, uh, you might look out and you'll see something like, oh, look, it's physics and the refraction of light. Isn't that incredible? Other people see a good Instagram picture uh, and some loads of other people just won't even notice it there. So um, we, we look outside and we will make sure that our reality fits what we expect it to be like. It genuinely, if I could convince you at the moment that everybody that drives a red car is crazy, like everybody that drives a red car is like a terrible driver, you will bend reality and you will ignore any time when it doesn't happen. These will work in conjunction. You'll go, did you see him? Did you see that? That's the red car thing. That's the red car problem. People who drive red cars, oof, crazy. And if your friend says, yeah, but what about that old man that we saw drive past us that drove past us at 30 miles an hour? Crazy. Why is he driving at 30 miles an hour? I mean, I know that's the speed limit, but I mean, he could at least hurry it up. I mean, oof, and we'll bend reality to make it fit. I'm going to give you a work example for this one, and then I'll show you a couple of examples of it in action. Um, imagine that I am now your boss. That would be weird because I know nothing about aquaculture. But imagine that that's just the case and I've been brought in. Some of you, I can imagine, there's a couple of little voices somewhere on this call that went, well, that wouldn't stop management in our place. Uh, you know, <laughs> he doesn't know anything about aquaculture. Why would that change anything? Probably could be boss. You know, I, I get that. But anyway, right, imagine I'm now your boss. Imagine as well that you work in a desk, okay? Right, just go with me with this, right? So you work in an office where there's a collection of desks and I walk in in the morning and what I do is as I walk in, because I'm quite a cheery guy most of the time, uh, is that I walk in and I say to everybody, morning everybody. And then I go to my desk and I sit down and I start my work. Easy? Okay. Not in the world of understanding how minds and mental health works as bubbles. Now, what happens is that actually somebody in the corner over there that is somebody who's normally a little bit anxious actually completely missed the fact that I said good morning entirely. They ignored it because their mind was totally on, I need to get this piece of work done, I need to get this piece of work done, I need to get this piece of work done. But this person over here, uh, sorry if I'm now pointing at you, by the way, I don't mean you specifically, but this person over here, uh, I had to, because I'm the boss, obviously, you know, I had to pull them up because the standard of their work recently has been a little bit, it's just been a little bit shoddy. So I actually had to pull them up and they're not happy. So what happens at lunchtime, so what happens at break time is this person's sitting in the canteen, you know, if a canteen, isn't that nice? So this person is now sitting in the canteen, talking to their colleagues, going like that. Did you hear him this morning? Did you hear him? Good morning, good morning, good morning. Like that as he wandered into the office. Do you know what he does as well? Have you seen, have you seen what he does? He does it right next to me. Every morning he walks in like that. Good morning. And do you know what he's doing it for? Because he's winding me up. He's getting at me. He knows that when he walks past and goes, good morning, he doesn't really mean it, not to me anyway. That's why he doesn't ever look at me. Somebody else on the other side who thinks that I'm the best boss that they've ever had is like, do you know what? They're sitting in the same canteen going, oh, no, I disagree. Do you know, every morning, I love it when he comes in. He's like a wee ray of sunshine. So he is. He's like a wee. And he comes in and he goes, good morning. Pure cheers me up. So it does. It like, just makes me dead happy. And I get, it, just, it just sets me up for the day as he comes in and just goes, good morning. I literally just came in and said, good morning but we had three different responses to it. And this is really important because actually what's happening is, is that what we think is real is being twisted and bent according to a lot of people, different people's belief systems. I'm going to imagine that just even with the names that are on uh, the, the call and we're on the call on, uh, on Monday, that you guys work with a fairly international community. It might not be huge, but it, it, it seems to be a relatively international community with lots of people from different cultures. You'll know this even culturally. You know that everybody jokes in Britain, for instance, about the fact that if you go to Newcastle, the first thing that you have to do is you just have to take your top off because they never wear a jacket. Apologies to any Geordies on here. Although I'm expecting you're probably sitting there going, yep, that's, yep, 
that's fairly accurate. But who needs a jacket? Um, so, whereas in Scotland, we have this thing, especially in Glasgow, we have this thing of we're dead friendly. We're not all the time, can I just say, but we're dead friendly and crazy party people. Uh, whereas the Aberdonians are a little more serious and a little more kind of like, they're, they're a wee bit more, they're, they're good people once you break, but there's a, there's a wall. I've done a lot of work in Aberdeen. There's a thing to break through to you Aberdonians. When we break through, then we unleash all your Celtic goodness, but you're a wee bit more reserved. So it's also, the reality has been bent through all of these norms, all of these cultural things. Let me just very quickly just show you a couple of examples because I want to go on to the last one and that's where we're going to finish today is on. There's one more to finish in. Uh, to this wee thing and then we'll finish for today. Uh, let me just show you these. Um, you may have seen these before, but these are great little perception tests. I'm going to do them very quickly and if anybody wants them shared, obviously this has been recorded, uh, so you'll have it anyway, but uh, we, can, we can share these out specifically uh, if you want these pictures to look at. Um, the two pictures that are in the middle, so the two squares, sorry, that are in the middle, not the ones scattered around the edge, they are both exactly the same colour exactly the same color. There is no difference in the top square and the bottom square. But what you're getting is an illusion where your brain is not seeing what it's really seeing because there's a little dark line in the middle of them that perceives or makes your mind perceive that there should be a shadow. So therefore, perceptually, your brain fixes the color that it's seeing and to be something a little bit lighter or a little bit darker. Genuinely, your brain is playing tricks on you. You are not seeing reality. If I do that, you'll see that there's absolutely no difference between top and bottom. You, there is no line uh, anywhere on that thing where you can see a difference between top and bottom. And if I take it away, then all of a sudden it just goes back again. Your brain cannot be trusted. Uh, here's another one. This is one of my favorites. There are 16 circles on that screen. There are 16 circles currently on your screen. You don't have to squint or make your eyes go crossed or anything to see them. They are there. The reason that you're potentially not seeing them and what you're seeing is groups and rows of rectangles is because the circles are made of straight lines. And people aren't used to seeing circles made of straight lines. So therefore, what happens is your brain doesn't perceive the circles because what it perceives is the straight lines. You cannot trust your mind. Sometimes things are right in front of you and you can't see them. This again comes into this whole idea of where does the problem not happen? If I just quickly show you four of them, I'm going to guess that at least 15 of the 22 people on this call just went, oh, <laughs> and that made a funny noise as all of a sudden the circles uh, just popped out. Um, oh, uh, Ellen's just saying that I'm not sh sharing my screen anymore, but it is saying to me that you're sharing the screen. So apologies, Ellen. Hopefully everybody else can see uh, see what's going on here. I'm just going to keep the chat up. So um, as well, now, if I take them away, I'm hoping that what happens now is that you can, now can see the circles. You might not actually be able to get back uh, to um, the, the main circles. And I'll just show you one more. And this one, which is a, a, a corker uh, a, as well, um, which is that that's not a spiral. Uh, that is not a spiral. That is a group of concentric circles uh, all the way going in. Ellen, not a problem at all. Glad it's sorted. Uh, glad it's sorted. So uh, if I go like this, um, then you can see that actually none of those circles are touching. Uh, this has got a name. This got, I can't remember what the name is, but eventually as, a, as, a, as an illusion, that's difficult to say, it's got a, a name. But if I take them away, it'll look like a spiral again. Now, my point here is that basically you cannot trust your mind. Your mind is constantly playing tricks on you. From a mental health perspective, this is for me, the, the nature of almost all anxiety and depression. Depression is where somebody starts to twist their reality because what they're seeing it through is a place where there's no purpose, where there's no hope. What happens from an anxiety point of view is that we catastrophize. So we then, we create a reality where we're bending it inside our heads to make it into something that it's not. The, for the, the reasons that most people have anxiety or panic attacks the things that they run in their head very, very rarely, I'm not saying never, but very rarely happen. But as we spoke about the other day, the fact that they're running in your head, just like the lemon, causes you to have the emotional response as if they were real. And that's a challenge, but it's a thinking challenge. It's not a broken thing. It's just a twist. It's just the mind's not doing the right thing. And then the last thing that our mind does is it makes assumptions. So it says, well, if this happened once, then this is going to happen again. So for instance, like my wee example of my good morning uh, earlier on, 
that person might genuinely now fall out of me. In fact, they could go to a friend and say, you know, he comes in every morning, good morning, uh, like this, I don't like him, honestly. He's, there's something about him that I just don't like. And now that person will now, now not like me, not because they've ever met me, but because they've been told not to like me by someone else and they'll make an assumption that they can trust their friend. So therefore, this person over here that says good morning must be a horrible person because it's just a pure assumption. How many things have you assumed in your life? How many times have you decided that because one thing happened, another thing can't happen or has happened? You know, sometimes we make assumptions and these can become really strong belief systems that really hinder us. I wonder if any of you that are on this call, I don't know if you have, but I'm hoping that, uh, that this is true for some of you because it means that you've gone through a big transformation where you've assumed because of certain experiences that you had when you were younger that something isn't going to happen for you when you get older. So what I mean by that is you decided that you were never going to find love or you decided that you were stupid and that you were never going to amount to anything. That maybe actually you even had to, you assumed that you could never work in your passion. Maybe other people assumed that and tried to put you off. How many people have said to some of you, I'm sure, oh, don't be silly. You can't make a career out of that. How can you make a career out of fish? How can you make a career out of going out to boats? How can you make a career out of, I saw one of you the other day who had left their camera on who had a beautiful picture of an octopus or something, I think it was an octopus, at their back. It looked spectacular. Uh, you know, you can't, but actually you have. And you've broken through those assumptions. I know that there's a mixed audience on here. But how many of you have assumed that because we're, this was originally done for women in Scottish aquaculture, how many of you have assumed that because you're a woman that you can't achieve a certain thing that a man can? And I hope that as many of you have broken that ceiling. Now, how many people, and this is the flip side when we start to talk about these types of things, how many people in higher management have assumed that because you're a woman, you can't do what a man can? And that is something that we have to battle against because what we need to change is we need to change that bubble sometimes. So I know I'm over time just very slightly, but just one more minute and I'll just explain how all this comes together. And then to, and Friday we'll talk about how it's actually made. What I'm saying here is, is that basically our life is all about perception. It's okay to say how things should be and how we would like things to be, but ultimately life is about how people perceive the world. Sometimes it's about our perception and about how our subjective experience within our mind is working. For many people with mental health challenges, their subjective experience is exactly where the problem comes from. From a lockdown perspective, if you're running inside your head just now, what if this doesn't end? Or what if you know, we have problems with this? Or as I said the other day, what if my experiment that I've been working for two years on because of lockdown, because I can't get to there, what if this subjective experience of that is holding you back. The challenge is, what can I do instead and how can I use what I have and re retune the bubble? From a point of view of a bigger cultural piece, the question is, especially in speaking, I would imagine predominantly uh, to the women who are, uh, who are watching this just now, that speaking as uh, to the audience of women in Scottish aquaculture, what needs to happen to be able to change that bubble? to be able to filter that bubble in a certain way. Because I'm telling you now that people are ignoring, bending, and assuming things about your experiences, about your studies, about what it is that you do. Now, many of them, they are absolutely 100% on your side. But that doesn't mean that there's not cultural issues where sometimes we have to fight against that to start pushing. And what I'm gonna do is, over the next little while, over the next lessons, I know that seems like a funny place to leave it, because you're like, uh, uh, tell me how I'm going to do it. That's going to take much longer than a minute. And we're going to be back on Friday to begin talking about that. But next week very much is going to be how to create the change. What I want to do this week is to tell you how it's all going to work. So I'm just going to stop the share and just pop back up again. Now, basically what I want you to do is remember your homework. Go out and fix something that you're ignoring. Go out there and get something sorted that you have been ignoring. And notice that... <gasps> that it gives you. I also want you to pay attention to that subjective experience. Ask yourself what you're thinking and just start to pay attention to how it is that, what it is that you're ignoring, what it is that you're bending and the assumptions that you have made that I promise you 
that if you want to bring any of them to me, I will challenge them directly for you if they, I feel they are holding you back. Remember, in the meantime, if you've got any questions at all, please send them into the email address. It's lockdown. So lockdown, just you know how to spell that. It's everywhere at headstrong. So headstrongnlp.com. So that's headstrongnlp, which is novemberlimapapa.com. That email address uh, is going to be live and it's private. It comes right to me and uh, nobody else will see it. So if you get any questions, please ask them and we'll maybe see if we've got a wee bit of time to answer them on Friday. Apart from that, thank you very much uh, indeed for everybody for joining us. Uh, have a beautiful Wednesday, whatever you're about to get up to um, for the rest of your day. I hope it goes fantastically. Pay attention to your bubble, make yourself some good lemons and I will speak to you again on Friday at the same time. See you later. Bye. Ahem. <clears throat>